Okay, so our next speaker is Professor P. Balram, uh, who is the former director of the Indian Institute of Science and the former editor of Current Science, among several other uh, editorships. Uh, he's currently Emeritus Professor at the Molecular Biophysics Unit uh, at IASC and the DST Year of Science Chair Professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences. Uh, Professor Balram's research has concerned the structure and function of peptides. Um, as editor of Current Science, as many of you uh, know very well, uh, Professor Balram has commented on a, a wide, on wide ranging themes related to science uh, through his uh, uh, legendary Sorry, editorials. Um, okay, I'd like the previous speaker, uh, he's been a member of many influential uh, science policy making bodies. Uh, he's well known um, uh, as an outstanding communicator, both in writing and as a speaker. Uh, uh, with scholarship and insights that he shares uh, in his inimitable and lucid style. Uh, so he no doubt will have uh, valuable thoughts to share with us on the topic uh, of his talk today, which is uh, science communication, shaping the public perception of science. Uh, Srikant, you, with, you need uh, a password. To open. Uh, okay. I, I hope it opens. I'll, I, I, no, no problem. Now, while Srikanth is opening the slides, I must say I was struck by Professor Narsimha talking about a meeting held in Kuno on uh, rationality, science, and so on. There was a meeting here right in this very hall in the 1970s when uh, one of Bangalore's uh, most uh, famous science popularizers, uh, Professor H. Narsimha of the National College, had actually brought along a Sri Lankan rationalist, Abraham Kovur, here. Mm -hmm. And the theme of the talk at that time was that any miracle that could be done by a godman would then be demonstrated by a Kovur uh, in this very hall. And as I recall it from after a gap of over 40 years, the hall was full. Uh, in those days, for such talks, we didn't have much diversions. So there would be people sitting all over, and there was much greater what I would call scientists' interest in science. Uh, you know, you would like the public to get interested in science, but first of all, it's also important that uh, scientists get interested in science uh, quite outside their own narrow uh, area of uh, specialization. Now, uh, Srikant's much better at this technology than I am. You have a Mac. But no, huh? not quite, yeah, not quite, not quite good enough. Huh? Uh, it's, 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 it's loading, but it's a little bit it's slow. Loading, slow, wonderful. Yeah. Even if you, <laughs> it'll come on. I try to time myself so that I don't cut into Mukun's uh, uh, Now, the problem time. is, this, uh, it's a physical, uh, this, I have to eject this eject that, uh, in yeah. order to load this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Now, one of our missing speakers, uh, <laughs> Professor Raghavinda Gadaka once wrote an article. He said that uh, sociologists usually just uh, read from a prepared text and uh, scientists need uh, their slides. Today, Professor Narsimha proved uh, that thesis wrong, uh, but I need the slides as a crutch. So, yeah, there you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, slide show. Just mark that one. Just highlight it, and then you start. That's it. And then you can just uh, change it here. As well. So, you know, sometimes, uh, the best dialogue uh, is silence. Uh, in many of the controversies that we have today, a uh, little bit of silence would be what one would wish for. Now, you know, what are scientists doing? I'm going to talk about the communication of science, and uh, because I think dialogue wants articles, and I presume that there are many prospective authors here among the students and the younger members of the audience. And it would be your task then uh, to try and explain what scientists do uh, to the outside world, to anybody who cares to read. And uh, science, of course, is represented by that young lady right at the bottom, 
And then, of course, there is looking over her shoulder uh, the government or with a magnifying glass asking, what are you doing? We've given you money to do some research. What research have you done? And in what way is that research going to be useful for society? Looking over the government, of course, is politics. Uh, in America, for example, congressmen ask many, many specific questions about projects which have been funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. They believe that these subjects should not be researched, public money should not be wasted on those topics, and therefore they ask questions about them. In India, also sometimes politicians ask questions. Very often, they don't ask you what you're doing. They only ask you, uh, can you do what you're doing without the money that we're giving you? Can we cut... <laughs> 50% uh, of your budget, and uh, then we're off. And then there's the media, represented here by Seema Singh, and uh, I think the media actually many times is the problem. And I think on this, scientists, government, and politicians will all agree. And uh, sometimes it's the picturing of science in the media the kind of reporting that is done. And when you talk to individual reporters, it's sometimes not even the individual reporter who's written the story, but the sub-editor who's actually headlined the story. So the headline sometimes promises something that the scientist is not delivering, is not going to deliver, and is never going to deliver. You know, diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, and cancer are going to be here a long time after certainly I'm gone and many members of the first row are gone, I suspect after almost everybody in the audience is gone. Now, if you're popularizing science by not writing but by going and talking, which is something that uh, I sometimes do, you will find that's the kind of reaction that you get. Uh, you have to really get audiences, uh, uh, especially young audiences, you'll have to drag them in screaming and kicking into a hall where scientists are going to tell them about science. If you go to the Bangalore Science Forum, India's longest running science forum uh, on the other end of town, you will find that you're greeted by an audience which is generally, the average age of the audience is closer to 70 than it is to 30. And uh, this is largely because as you age, you do get interested in science. You actually get interested in biology. The reason you get interested in biology is your, whole, your own biology is failing. And you would now like to understand what is going wrong with you and are there ways in which this can now be rectified. Now, dialogues. Dialogues have been thought of for a long time. And the most, you need dialogue when there's a communication breakdown. Uh, and which are the famous breakdowns of communication? One of them is when C.P. Snow gave his read lectures in Cambridge in 1959. By that time, sitting in the dining halls of Cambridge, Snow had come to the conclusion that the scientists and uh, the faculty, the professors in the humanities and so forth, were no longer talking to one another, even at the dinner table. Uh, uh, physics was in ferment at that time. Rutherford was then the ruling pope of physics. He was there in Cambridge. And of course, the scientists had a certain arrogance about them. Physicists have always had an arrogance about them, which has never quite disappeared over time. <laughs> but then, that is only a sidelight. But this is what Snow worried about. He worried about the two cultures, the culture of science and the culture of the humanities and the social sciences. But he was also worried about the condition of Britain at that time. Post-war Britain, about 15 years after the war was over, was not quite the imperial power that it was. And it was going down in every way. And he said something very interesting. He says that the position of Britain was precarious. And he says that is the result of history and accident. And isn't to be laid to the blame of any Englishman now living. If our ancestors had invested talent in the Industrial Revolution instead of the Indian Empire, we might be more soundly based now, but they didn't. This is a rather interesting analysis of England at that time. Professor Narasimha said something which I found very interesting. He said in the, 18th, the 17th century, India's exports vastly outnumbered its imports. In fact, India didn't want anything from outside. Why did it not want anything from outside? Because it had all the raw materials here. It had all the materials for existence over here. It had many things to offer the world. The world had nothing to offer India. When did the world get something to offer to India? It happened in the 18th, 
the, it happened really in the 19th and the 20th centuries, particularly in the 19th century when the Industrial Revolution was at its peak. Every aspect of the Industrial Revolution, including chemistry, the synthesis of the dyes, for instance, then completely uh, demolished uh, indigenous production in India. Synthetic indigo uh, then, of course, took over. He also said something which I found interesting. He said, if scientists had the future in their bones, then the traditional culture responds by wishing the future did not exist. This is, to some extent, the kind of situation in which we find ourselves today. When sometimes you would like to look back on the past and you would like to think that science and technology and many activities which go on today which need funding, which need support, which need encouragement, are activities which are going to take you possibly in quite the wrong direction. There's another famous uh, essay uh, written by the evolutionist Dobzhansky long ago, appeared in a very strange place, the American biology teacher. And the reason it appeared here was because there's always been this tension between the teaching of uh, Darwinian natural selection and uh, religion, Christianity in specifically, in the United States. And what he tried to do in this essay, of course he, say, he made that famous statement which every biologist quotes that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. But that quotation is used by biologists against other biologists. It's used by uh, the evolutionary biologists against the molecular biologists who don't worry too much about evolution. On the other hand, the rest of his essay is what one should read if one wants to understand the kind of tensions that exist between science on the one hand and the beliefs of religion on the other, and how Dobzhansky in fact says this. He says, does the evolutionary doctrine clash with religious faith? And he categorically says it does not. He in fact argues that there is no real conflict here. Fortunately, uh, Hinduism, for instance, does not have any particular uh, issue uh, with uh, uh, evolutionary theory. But since I have to talk about the public perception of science, uh, the public perception of science is frequently gauged in the United States by doing surveys. Uh, the, uh, the Americans are good at doing surveys, they're good at collecting data, they're good at documenting them, they check their data, they tell you how they've collected their data, and then they provide an analysis. So, uh, in India, however, we are very poor at collecting data, we are even poorer at maintaining it, and we, of course, do not discuss it. Now, the biomedical sciences, is it safe to eat genetically modified foods? Now, it says 37% of U.S. adults believe that it is safe. The remaining, an overwhelming majority, a two-thirds majority, with which we can even change the Constitution, are now say that it's unsafe to eat genetically modified food. Whereas the scientists who belong to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which produces the journal Science, 88%. So there's a large difference in perception between scientists, practicing scientists, and the general public. Favoring the use of animals in research, scientists outnumber the general public two to one. So this is, is it safe to eat foods grown with pesticides? Most people believe that it's unsafe, our scientists, however, believe it's safe. And uh, I must say that when you read about pesticides, uh, and I'll come back to it with an example, and later you will find out why uh, I'm reading about pesticides, but uh, you will find that if you read about pesticides, you won't eat anything. Uh, you would stop eating altogether. But climate change, mostly due to human activity. They were better. 50% of people believe that it's due to human activity, but 87% of scientists. But if you go a little bit further in this and ask the question, genetically modified food, it turns out that a very large number of US adults actually believe it's unsafe. And one reason is because the science behind genetically modified foods has sometimes been presented incorrectly, it hasn't been presented well, and you can't convince even other scientists because a lot of the discussion in India, for example, the Indian National Science Academy's report, was not a report which inspired confidence in anybody who read it. 
It also did not inspire confidence that many prominent scientists were in fact in the press arguing against genetically modified foods. So even in these areas, there is disagreement between scientists. And this cartoon summarizes it very well. Here, minister, here's the pesticide resistant crop. A species which can eat it is in the pipeline. Now, what this really means is just like the problem of antibiotic resistance, where indiscriminate use of antibiotics leads to resistance, there can in fact be problems even with crops which have been modified to resist a particular kind of uh, insect. Because they will then be, then biology will in fact get to work. So there are scientific problems here which people do discuss. Here is the earth is warming. Now it turns out among U.S. adults, we had 50% saying, yes, the Earth is warming because of anthropogenic or human activity. But it turns out that the Republicans, only 27%. The Democrats, 71%. And this, of course, tells you, now you have here is President Donald Trump. And there's a list of things which he says are humbug. And I rather liked this list, because this list tells you that if, we, if the Americans manage to re-elect a Donald Trump for a second term, then maybe the rest of the world has a chance to catch up with American science and technology. <laughs> he's against any work, he's against immigrants, but that's okay. Uh, I'm too old to go. Uh, climate change, that he doesn't like. He doesn't like education, he doesn't like energy, he doesn't like science, he doesn't like many things. And uh, he is in fact now setting the agenda for any kind of dialogue that might be there in the United States. But then we can't worry only about Mr. Trump. We have to worry about things closer home. Here is popularization of science. I read in the news, after I got uh, Srikant's email inviting me to come and speak here, I began to read everything that I could find in the newspapers with some interest. And I found this aspirant scientist may first need to tell a story. This worried me because thesis should be fact and not fiction. And it says initiative for better engagement with common citizens. This is, of course, the popularization of science. And he said the DST is working on a scheme to get doctoral candidates in science programs to publish at least one popular science article explaining their research before they land a degree. And I found this extraordinarily worrisome because you, uh, you find it hard enough to get them to f publish one good scientific paper. <laughs> and now you have the students now trying to publish one article uh, in the Deccan Herald or, uh, or the Hindu, or maybe even if they don't aim very high uh, in the Times of India. <laughs> then uh, Now is writing then, and this is by uh, the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology in the presence of the minister, so one has to be worried. Because it's going to be an edict very soon. Uh, now here's my worry about writing. Uh, you have to write for dialogue. Uh, now Srikant said everybody, Meva Singh said everybody, everyone said everyone's got to write for dialogue. Now if you're going to write for dialogue, uh, you are going to meet with peer review. And this is what worried me. Because if you meet with peer review, you will meet with editors. Editors usually look like this. Uh, uh, I'm the only editor who looks different. And uh, here is a prospective author, and the prospective author now has got the manuscript, editors read it, and starts off, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, etc., etc., and the editor says, nothing doing. We are going to take that line out, because we don't want to offend anyone who has bad times, we also don't want to glorify people who have good times, so we take it out altogether. <laughs> that, of course, is from Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. And that's how the tale of two cities, which some of us read in our childhood, uh, really begins. So if one's going to write, I would think that one should read indiscriminately and study styles. And uh, you must find a topic if you can't, if you're not assigned a topic. And all this, I think, is going to become very important for all the poor graduate students. I'm glad I'm retired. Uh, uh, They'll have to learn all of this before they satisfy the Department of Science and Technology's uh, diktat that every student can't submit a PhD thesis until they've published one uh, uh, article. Now, writing can be difficult. Uh, it's uh, not easy. 
and uh, you need to worry about things like punctuation. And, uh, you know, punctuation, you look at the cartoons, you understand them. Uh, commas make this profound difference. And uh, when commas make this profound difference, uh, everything changes, really. your meaning. Uh, when I used to write, uh, a critic once wrote to me uh, that uh, the editor's punctuation is somewhat strange in his editorials. He appears to march to the beat of his own drummer. <laughs> well, sometimes writers can march to the beat of their own drummer, but very often if you're dealing with, the sci with scientific writing, you are constrained in many ways. But there are also people who write well, but who never submit their articles. Uh, they write and they write and they correct and they correct. And if you do this, you will never manage to communicate anything. So if any of you are interested in writing, uh, write, submit it, and let the editor reject it. <laughs> and uh, there are many, many uh, uh, books that you will find, uh, uh, but I'll show you my next slide. Uh, this uh, J.B.S. Holden uh, wrote this wonderful article on how to write a proper popular scientific article a long time ago. And uh, I like this because he says that somewhere along the line, he says, uh, literary synthesis is like organic chemical synthesis. This is something that I did when I was young. So I said, the method to be adopted depends on the product required, the raw materials, and the apparatus available. As my brain is my apparatus and different from yours, my methods will also be different from yours. So this means nobody can teach you how to write. You uh, just have to figure out how to write it. But I rather like the last sentence. He says that, uh, for you will not get an article on the history of 18th century physics into a daily newspaper. So you must know what to write. Occasionally, there are scientific papers which have lines which you wish you had written. And many uh, plagiarists have taken this line and put it at the end of their own papers. The only difference is that their papers did not have the same significance as the Watson Crick double helix paper. And you can see that it has not escaped our notice, etc. But you might ask another question. Suppose you'd read this paper in 1953. Would you, as a general reader of science, have immediately grasped what its implication was and dashed off an article to the uh, New York Times uh, immediately? The answer is no, because it turns out that in 1953, when the Watson Crick double helix paper appeared in Nature, another paper appeared in Science. Now, uh, this was the famous experiment which was done on the prebiotic synthesis of the amino acids by putting a flash discharge uh, through uh, a flask which had been evacuated and uh, had been filled with the gases, hydrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, water, ammonia, and so forth. And this was an experiment done by Stanley Miller as a young graduate student in Chicago. And then he found the amino acids. This immediately suggested that there could be an abiotic origin for the molecules of biochemistry, and therefore it was called the origins of life experiment. The origins of life experiment made it to the front page of the New York Times in 1953. The Watson Crick paper did not. This means that the immediate understanding of what this paper was about was not clear even to other scientists when they read them. And therefore, to Imagine that a popular article could be written immediately uh, is somewhat more difficult. Now I'm going to show you something because I, I came here wanting to talk about writing too. I looked at the October 6th issue of Science. And if you're going to read anything in order to popularize science, the best things to read are science and nature. Because you can read the article, you won't understand anything. In fact, in any issue of science and nature, I don't find a single article that I can readily understand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they looked at, they appear to be in interesting subjects, but if you look at the perspectives and the news written in the first part of the journal, you then get a picture of what the article is about. And the October 6th issue of sci uh, Science contained three articles which I looked at. And why did I make slides? I made all these slides simply because post-retirement, I learned how to do PowerPoint myself. <laughs> and uh, then I thought that I must try this out. Uh, on an audience to see if you can find the mistakes that uh, I've actually made. This was called nerve agents in honey. And it turns out that crops are sprayed with pesticides. Pesticides like these molecules, and they keep the pests away from the crop. The pesticides go into the soil, and from the soil they're picked up by other plants. They get through the plants, they get onto the uh, flowers, they get to the pollen, 
The chemicals now are there as pollutants on the pollen. The bees pick them up. They go back to the honeycomb, they make the honey, and then the pesticides end up also in the honey. But very little pesticide ends, in the, ends up in the honey according to this uh, particular article because they've used all the modern techniques of analytical chemistry to find out how much uh, pesticide is there in, the, in honey all over the world, how much pesticide there is in soil all over the world, mapped it onto a wonderful map of the world, and I found a big... Uh, Mark only in Karnataka, I didn't read it enough to find out which place had the pesticide. But the more important thing here is these are nerve agents which act on the insects. They also act on the bees. And because they act on the bees' nervous system, they disrupt learning and memory in the bees. And then the bees then forget how to navigate once again. So here is a problem which will keep the bees now from pollinating. And now if the bees don't pollinate, you're going to have much greater problems in the future uh, with other crops. Here's another paper. This is the title of the paper. The title of the paper is right at the bottom. Long-term pattern and magnitude of soil carbon feedback to the climate system in a warming world. Not the kind of paper that if you were not a climate scientist, you would really want to read. But then there's somebody who's written another article which popularizes this. He says, microbial change in warming soils. This means even if you were a microbiologist, you might say, look, there's microbe there. Uh, let me go ahead and read the paper. And then it says, long-term reorganization of microbial communities leads to pulses in carbon release. Now, there are many, many interesting things for policymakers uh, to read in this paper. First of all, to do measurements like this, it's taken 27 years. And if you're going to take 27 years, you, your project must be supported for 27 years. You can't, for example, have your project terminated uh, because uh, you haven't published a paper. You can't publish a paper until all the data is in. In fact, next time you listen to a climate, all the younger people, next time you listen to a climate change talk, look carefully at that one slide which every climate change scientist will show you, how global warming, temperature, and carbon dioxide levels. That carbon dioxide map or graph is the result of one single scientist who worked for many years without funding and he worked for an annual report which has a result every year other than another number. So sometimes this kind of science does need needs to understand what is going on. Here what this means is that when you start the measurement over here, as you warm over time, the microbes now Sort of, these are the initial conditions when you start warming. After microbes have eaten up much of the biomass over here, you get microbial carbon starvation, you get molecules which are formed here which are very difficult to degrade by the microbes, the lignins and so forth. At that point, the microbial, you can see that the amount of carbon dioxide em emitted goes all the way down here, but then picks up again. Because here what happens is the impoverished microbial community now shifts. It shifts because of evolution. It has to survive in that environment. It now finds ways of treating all the uh, undegradable biomass which is accumulating. And then again, uh, carbon metabolism picks up once again. And again, it goes down. This now is a cyclic process. Now, this is a very interesting thing. Because you learn a lot about microbiology, you learn a lot about how microbes are adapting, you get new microbes which you might be able to use elsewhere, and therefore this kind of research is something that happens. But then there's the other end. The other end of the spectrum is there in uh, this issue of science itself. If you read, the title of the paper will come on the next uh, slide because it's rather complicated. So this says the proton radius revisited. This is the kind of thing that physicists like to do, and they usually need a lot of money to do this. It wasn't cheap to detect gravitational waves and uh, get a Nobel Prize. Uh, it wasn't very easy uh, to do the other experiments, which have been these major experiments at CERN and so forth. They cost billions and billions of uh, dollars. And the kind of question that is being asked there is what would form legitimately into the realm of pure basic science, where you don't really see an immediate application for it. Nevertheless, it costs a lot, lot of money. Would you like to know the radius of the proton? I suspect 
vast majority of scientists don't want to know the radius of the proton. No biologist I know wants to know the radius of the proton, so it would be difficult to imagine that somebody in Maleshwaram now wants to know the radius of the proton. <laughs> so we can't go and talk to them about the radius of the proton. What is the radius of the proton? Because I was sort of interested uh, in the proton, and the title of the paper is The Rydberg Constant and Proton Size from Atomic Hydrogen. This should gladden the heart of any physicist over here because the experiments, I think, are incredibly sophisticated when you look at them and don't understand a word of it. But eventually, here's the controversy over which physicists will now probably stop talking to one another. Whether the proton has a radius of 0.87 femtometers or whether it has a radius of 0.83 femtometers. And a femtometer, I'll remind you, 10 raised to minus 15 meters. Now, this, of course, would be a subject which is difficult now to convey uh, to the public. But nevertheless, it's interesting. I think it should at least be conveyed to other physicists and later on maybe to chemists who occasionally talk about the proton. There's the Rydberg constant uh, measured to innumerable decimal places. But then the fundamental constants determine, I suspect, whether we live or die uh, eventually. I want to draw your attention to a favorite uh, book of mine available on the internet, which is on basic science and technological innovation, written by a professor of political science at Princeton, Donald Stokes, who died many years ago. And he died before the book was published. So there's what is called Pasteur's Quadrant, which, uh, like any true good political scientist, he just drew a square, divided it into four quadrants, and named one of the quadrants as uh, a Pasteur's Quadrant. I've just used my uh, prowess with uh, Google and uh, cut, paste, and PowerPoint uh, to color this up. This is what is called applicable research. I am not sure that I heard Professor Narsima right, but he did use the word translation. Now, translation is a word which is feared by scientists who now go looking for grants. Because everybody sitting on the other side of the table asks the question, uh, can this research be translated? Now, translated into what, I do not know. But this is what I would call use-inspired research and fundamental research. And what uh, Stokes really said was that this last quadrant here is what he called Pasteur's quadrant. Because Pasteur's work, uh, both in the foundations of organic stereochemistry, the relationship between molecular structure and optical activity, and also in the foundational work that he did on vaccines and microbiology, really exemplified both the highest elements of basic research and also the most applicable and useful kind of research that anybody could do. But then he was in the 19th century. Difficult to do that now in the 21st century. There was Bohr, of course, looking at the hydrogen atom. And in fact, this particular paper in science refers to Bohr and says that it even talks about Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. That was the uh, last sentence in the paper that I really understood. But uh, there's Bohr, and you, I guess the Bohr model did lead to useful physics uh, and eventually to application. Uh, one might sort of argue with the kind of applications uh, which atomic physics has uh, uh, provided, but it did lead to many, many wonderful applications. Edison, of course, could have discovered the electron, but he didn't try. Uh, there's a page in his book which suggests that he might be sort of co-labeled the, the electron, the co-discoverer of the electron. Edison was interested in illumination, and he produced a light bulb, illuminated all our lives uh, as a consequence. Now, where is most of average academic and industrial R&D? or I might add uh, industrial uh, academic R&D in India right here. The only iconic figure that I could find here was Lakshman's common man. And eventually in this academic space, uh, we uh, commoners in science will have to find our way uh, whichever path one wants to take. And uh, I think this is a useful way of thinking about basic and applied research. Is the public understanding of science important? The public understanding of science is important. I'll show you one example. This is the famous Gleevec case, uh, Imatinib, which came before the Supreme Court in India, where a patent discussion was there on this cancer drug. The case itself was at the intersection of science, medicine, and law. It turns out that scientists and law, medical practitioners are generally sober people. Uh, lawyers are not. 
they are mostly on the street uh, demonstrating and breaking the law. Uh, but all of them were together in this case. And this was the Supreme Court of India. And they passed this judgment. This is probably the one judgment which relates to science of the Supreme Court, which everybody should read. Because it's a very scientific judgment. Very good judgment. Small judgment. No language in it that you can't understand. And it was de delivered by these distinguished judges, unfortunately, on the 1st of April 2013. <laughs> they could have picked a better date. But in this, before this, the patent law was enacted by Parliament. So there was a discussion in Parliament before the law was enacted. And the Supreme Court actually commented in the judgment on the Parliament debate. And they say this. He says, the bill evoked a highly insightful and informed debate on the subject. To anyone going through the debate on the bill, Parliament would appear keenly alive to national interests. I don't know what they meant by this. <laughs> it sounds like the judges were in fact saying that Parliament is generally not alive to national interests. I don't know. Uh, coming back to my issue of science, here's the cover so that you can go and read it. The cover is on single cell genomics. It says single cell epigenomics, recording the past and predicting the future. If you read that title, and if you're a newspaper reporter, you can say today scientists, especially if you're a sub-editor, you can say from single cell genome, scientists now are able to predict the past and the future. <laughs> now, if you read the abstract, of course, it says this will allow new levels of understanding of cell fate decisions. So they're only worried about the fate of a single cell, not the fate of a whole organism. But it won't be long before there is a public case for single cell genomics being the way in which uh, every human problem is going to be solved. For those of you who are interested in both history and biology, I draw your attention to this book. This book is called The Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. It draws the connection between history and biology. And it talks about the cognitive revolution, which has really led eventually to the kind of change that one has in science and our understanding of nature. He says the cognitive revolution, which according to this book began some 30,000 years ago, is accordingly the point when history declared its independence from biology. And there are many other things which, is, which are said in this book which merit careful reading today. It says, for instance, to understand the rise of Christianity or the French Revolution, it is not enough to comprehend the interactions of genes, hormones, and organisms. It is necessary to take into account the interaction of ideas, images, and fantasies as well. In fact, it will turn out that fantasies and myths across cultures are really what have driven uh, modern civilization to the point at which it is today. And here you have the tension now arising between the traditional view of civilization and the scientist's view of the world around us. And that is where I think the conflicts of the future, in India particularly, will really have. And that's where the public understanding of science probably will be very, very important. Science and society, which is there in the title of this uh, uh, seminar itself, you can see the only cartoon that I think, uh, this is what the common man looks like when he looks in on what scientists are doing. He is, in fact, bewildered. He doesn't know what they're doing. If you let all the general public in to the institute on open day, the institute is filled with thousands of people. And every de department is demonstrating experiments. Science looks like it's fun. In fact, Shiv Vishwanathan, a few days ago on NDTV in a discussion, kept on saying science is fun. And the audience looked rather gloomy, and the other participants looked even gloomier. <laughs> but look at the scientist's view of the common man. This, of course, I think looks like ISRO. It's the Man on the Moon project. And here is a man from ISRO. He says, this is our man. He can survive without water, food, light, and shelter. And sometimes today, when you look at the problem of clinical trials which are being done in India, you will find that clinical trials are being done without a proper understanding of the people who are, in fact, subject to these trials. And therefore, there must be much greater public engagement on uh, scientific subjects. Now, of course, I have the last line. I told you a famous first line from Dickens. <laughs>
Now, there must also be famous last lines. So when you're writing something, make sure that your punchline comes at the very end. You can't do better than Gone with the Wind. You know, here's Scarlett O'Hara, and this is just after Rhett Butler has left her. And the most famous line in Gone with the Wind, if you look, is when Rhett Butler says, my dear, I don't give a damn. But that's not the most famous line. This, in fact, I think is the most famous line. He says, Tara talks to her slaves at home. I'll go home and I'll think of some way to get him back. After all, tomorrow is another day. In launching uh, dialogue, as an old, retired, and tired editor, I must say that the Academy is, in fact, following in Scarlett O'Hara's footsteps in being extraordinarily optimistic. And tomorrow, after all, is another day. Thank you.